All right, how's everybody doing today? Great, almost at the end. Um, so we're just gonna jump right in. I have about 300 slides that we have to get through in 30 minutes. So um, I'm here to talk a little bit about the, the future of templating in Ember. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Chad Hytella. I'm the senior staff software engineer at LinkedIn, where I get to work on a bunch of open source infrastructure that help power LinkedIn's uh, web properties. I'm also part of the Ember.js core team, um, where I've done a lot of work on the Glimmer VM over the past couple years. I've been working on the router as of late. Um, and then several or two, three weeks ago, uh, I started participating in like TC39 along with Yehuda and Tom and Godfrey to try to get decorators to stage three. Um, I don't, I, at this point I don't really, <laughs> at, at this point I haven't really participated too much in the conversation, it was more or less uh, going to the meeting in the, in the basement of uh, Masonic Lodge in New York City to uh, watch them uh, talk about things, I guess. Um, so, I actually really like coming to Amsterdam. I've had New Year's here two years now, on the past eight years. Um, I was here for 2017 and I was here in 2011, so I love coming to Amsterdam. Um, if you've never been here for New Year's Eve, it's pretty crazy, like Dam Square is just filled with like fireworks all over the place. It's, Pretty nuts. Um, so yeah, I think this, this conference has been great, the venue's been great, the city's been great. Um, so yeah. So let's talk about templating. Uh, before we get into like what's changing, um, all this like you know, t new template stuff, we first have to kind of set context of why Ember has templating in the first place. So it's been talked about a little bit, and there's been some jokes about like Sprout Core. Uh, but Sprout Core, for those who aren't aware, is the framework that kind of predates Ember. Um, and it was completely modeling Co the Cocoa framework at Apple by directly mapping basically the APIs onto a JavaScript-like um, type of API. And because of this, this meant that you didn't have a declarative way of like constructing your views, they were like a class, and then they were all kind of like this widget-based thing where you didn't write HTML or CSS, you did everything in JavaScript. This sounds pretty familiar nowadays, but um, that's how like Spark Car worked, and what uh, Tom and Yehuda found was that it was pretty hard to approach uh, the framework as like somebody that is like a UX developer or somebody that is like a designer who wants to just be able to work in HTML and CSS and be able to update these, uh, these views. And so that's why we have uh, templating inside of Ember is to make it much more approachable for web developers. And so we kind of have to talk a little bit about design principles and like Scott uh, Newcomer talked a little bit about some of uh, designing with like, pr or, you know, having principles when it comes to software engineering. Um, and that's true about like how we approach the templating layer. He also talked about uh, this quote by Sir Tim Berners-Lee and it is definitely one of the founding principles of like the idea around designing a template language. And what he says is computer science in the 1960s and 1980s spent a lot of effort making languages that were as powerful as possible. Nowadays, we have to appreciate reasons for picking not the most powerful solution, but the least powerful solution. The reason for that is the less powerful the language, the more you can do with the data that's stored in the language. Now, he was talking about the semantic web and being able to look at an HTML document and do different things with it, like pass it through different like compilers or parsers and extract like, you know, like tables or you want to do indexing on the content. It's like a very simple uh, declarative language um, and because of that, there, you can do just a lot more with the data that's in it, like extracting data. You can layer on different things on top of HTML. It's like a pretty nice design and it's quite simple. So for us, what that means is we we can layer on effectively a superset of HTML. So the things that are in green here are really talking about the HTML specification. And any HTML that has basically ever existed, now I'm papering over a bunch of things uh, in the HTML specification, but any HTML that you write today can just be in handlebars template. And it's only until you start adding like these triple or these double curlies into it that it gains like some dynamic superpowers, right? So it's very easy to approach and HTML specification in this principle allows us to separate the static parts which are HTML and the dynamic parts which are always talking about this custom thing that we've created, like the handlebars language on top of it. So 
that's like one of the founding principles, but I think more recently, uh, the work that we've been doing on the, the Glimmer VM and the templating language, I think this quote by uh, Albertson and Sussman are kind of, it bottles up what we are trying to achieve with the templating language. And what they say is, pro, uh, there's, they're actually the authors of, if you're not aware of uh, the wizard book, it's also called Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, it's like a pretty famous book on Scheme. Um, and so what they say is programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally machines to execute. And so this will see how like this is this quote is kind of guiding I think a lot of the different things that we're doing inside the templating layer. The other thing that we have to talk about is simplicity and ease. Um, these words often get like confounded. There's a, a great talk by Rich Hickey, you can say if it's great or not, uh, where he talks about unrolling what simplicity and ease actually means. Um, but I wanna talk about it more in the terms of what that means when you're approaching uh, like a templating language and designing it. So typically, I wanna say that simplicity is, it's obvious what to do. However, achieving the overall goal might actually be very difficult to do. Um, where ease is typically refers to very little effort to achieve a task, however, the overall goal may be complex. So an example of that outside of software engineering, we would say that like woodworking is simple. Like there's not much you can do with wood. You can like carve it, you can nail it together. Um, but uh, building something in wood is definitely not easy. If you're like whittling like a log to create a sculpture, it's not gonna be easy by any means, but it is simple, it's a very simple concept. Where something is like GPS is actually easy. Just follow what the GPS is telling you to do and you'll eventually get to the place that you are. But the overall directions to get you there might actually be complex. And so when we're looking at the templating language, we have to try to find this balance between simplicity of, and ease. And I wanna quickly walk through an example where we've gotten this wrong in the past. So who here has been using Ember long enough that they remember this version of each? Okay, that's quite a few of you. So for those who aren't familiar with how this worked was that in your template you would write something like this, you would have like name that's on the context, and then post you just assumed it was like an array-like thing, and then you would iterate over each one of the things. Now, this is a little bit weird um, because it seems like simple, there's not that many moving parts to it, you just pass an array. But in the, the context of the block is where things got pretty hairy. Um, so title there is not actually talking about the title on the context, it is talking about the current post under iteration and the property on it. So it's like post uh, bracket zero dot title is what it's talking about inside that block. So there's implicit scope here. Um, and so, as many of you may have experienced, this was very bad, largely because you cannot reach to other variables outside of the scope that had been created for you. So like name here that's being used at the top level was not actually available with, uh, to you inside of this block. And so this was like a, kind of a language design flaw in some sense, um, and it's, we chose like this very kind of like, what seemed to be a simple thing and an easy thing actually be tur turned into a very complex thing. So what did we do about this? Well, I can't remember what version this landed in, I think it was like 1.4. Uh, we made the, the, the actual syntax for each to be a little bit more complex. There's more things in the actual like signature, um, but it cleaned up a lot of learning problems, um, and you didn't have like this weird, uh, this context problem with the block. So the way that all templates work today is that there is no isolated like block scope or anything like that. Everything is value evaluated as like top level. So you can reach to things on the context, which like would be the name variable, but inside of the block, you are using it almost like a for each or a map or a filter inside of the JavaScript language where you get some parameters in the block position. But like these are things that you have, you have to learn, but I think everybody agrees that this is much nicer than trying to figure out how you're gonna get stuff into um, the block and do something with it. So this is kind of like, uh, that's an evolution of 
kind of the templating layer, but along that same period of time, there has been an evolution of the rendering engine underneath. So for those who aren't familiar, um, there has been three or four different rewrites of the rendering engine inside of Ember. The first solution was a string concatenation solution that put all these like crazy metamorph tags inside of your, uh, your uh, in, in your DOM to keep track of where the dynamic and static parts were. Then there was HTML bars, which was uh, getting away from string concatenation and just using raw DOM methods to construct the DOM instead of strings. Then there was Glimmer 1, which was uh, layering on the React style semantics of like, when I call set, we're gonna re-render everything top down um, and redo the, or basically re-render the view that way. And then there was Glimmer 2, which was a, a code name for uh, a rewrite of the rendering engine, but it, we now call it the Glimmer VM. And what the Glimmer VM is, is it kind of represents a runtime for a programming language that is um, specifically, or it's a programming language specifically for constructing views. Um, and when I say that it, it it's, called the Glimmer VM because it's actually implemented as a virtual machine under the hood. And what I mean that it is implemented like a virtual machine, it looks like the insides of like any other programming language runtime uh, that exists in modern times. And this evolution has really allowed us to do a lot of different uh, things from like uh, user APIs, and uh, I'll get through those uh, next, but I believe that the design of the virtual machine has, or the design of the rendering engine has actually forced us to really evaluate how we're designing the language on top of it. Um, and this kind of goes back to the original quote of like, uh, like the program should be like easy for humans to read and then make it easy, or then just incidentally that the VM or whatever can actually execute it. And so if you can align those worlds, the actual implementation of the virtual machine becomes easier if you really think about the language that you're designing on top of it. So, like I said, it's actually afforded us a lot of like cool features. So uh, the Glimmer VM has the ability to execute a bytecode format and compile your templates into basically a bunch of numbers instead of uh, like a JavaScript. Um, we've done experiments where we swapped out parts of the actual Glimmer VM to use a WebAssembly core for the low-level VM, which is just more or less like pushing and popping from the stack, incrementing numbers, setting state on registers. Uh, it's allowed us to do things like rehydration with like server-side rendering, and it can do this thing called incremental render, which basically means that instead, instead of making one long blocking call on the main thread, we can chop up rendering into like incremental parts and let the browser paint um, as often as it, as it wants to instead of like having the white screen of death that I think a lot of people are aware of. But this talk actually isn't too much about the Glimmer VM. I've given a pretty in-depth talk about how the Glimmer VM works. Uh, you can check it out here. So coming back to actually designing uh, the templating language, what we're actually trying to strive for is clarity. When I look at a template in Ember, I want to be able to figure out what this thing is doing. And this sounds, if you've worked on Ember projects for a long enough time, like you've learned about all of like these ambiguities in the language where you have to do a little bit of your own introspection all over the place to figure out what it's actually talking about. And what the future of the templating layer is try to bring more clarity to the template, uh, the templating language as a whole. And what this means from like a design perspective, it means that we want to get closer to static semantics inside of the, the templating layer so that when we say, when you say like curly, curly, whatever, it has an actual meaning to it, to it and it's not ambiguous from you as the person that's writing it and from the runtime underneath it. So we're gonna take a look at a lot of RFCs um, that are building up this picture of getting to a more, uh, static semantics or having more clarity inside our templates. So the first one that we kind of introduced in, uh, into Ember was arguments, it's RFC 276. A lot of people have talked about this. Um, this is like one thing about like going towards the end of a conference. Um, but what the arguments proposal uh, said was that when you look at a template like this, 
Can anybody here tell me where like name is defined, where posts is defined? And the actual question or the actual answer is you don't know. You cannot look at a template um, and know where these things are being defined. Now, sure, this starts the journey of okay, let me look, go look at my component class. Doesn't seem to be there, so let me go look at every single invocation site where this component is being invoked and see if people are passing things or maybe these things aren't even actual. Um, they're not values, they're like helpers that take no arguments to that. Like the syntax doesn't tell you what it is. And so what the arguments proposal does is it says that anything that's passed to you, you just prefix it with uh, an at sign and now you know that this thing is an argument to you. Um, and you can look at a template and confidently know kind of what the interface of this component is going to be. So it's great. Uh, this is in 3.4, which uh, is the release uh, that landed on Monday, so you can use this in your Ember application today. So this is kind of like, it's the future, but it's actually here today um, type of thing. It's just like probably no applications here are using this, or not a lot of them are. Um, to kind of follow up with that, there is this RFC uh, 308, which is an RFC that I wrote. Um, it has a different name, but I just called it required this. So going back to this problem of what is this thing? This, this thing can be many things right now inside of Ember. This can be a component, which is like the first thing that you would expect it to be. You think it could be a helper with just a dash in it, it could be that. It could also be a property on the context. You could you know, do like a string uh, based property and do foo dash bar in it, and your colleagues probably will not like that, but uh, you could totally do that, it will resolve. Um, and so what RC 308, is, is it's outlining the forms of what it, these things mean inside of the actual templating language. So what I said was like, at foo is always an argument, this dot foo is talking about a property on the backing class, with that, this dot foo as foo. Uh, if it's in a block, it's a local, and then foo is always a helper in this world. And so what does this look like when we go to our example and we tack some stuff on? It looks like this, and this is a little bit more writing, but it makes it extremely clear to somebody that's looking at the template where this stuff is coming from. Um, if you're familiar with like React or some of these other solutions out there, they, they've done this since the beginning. You have like props and state, and it separates out the local state on the backing component class and things that were passed to you, and this is kind of our answer for that. And luckily, this has been in Ember since 1.0. Uh, <laughs> you can use this syntax, it just works. Uh, I put the asterisk there because this RFC specifically talks about removing the fallback behavior. So at runtime today, what we do is we, we say, okay, check to see if it's a component. If it's not a component, check to see if it's a helper. If it's not a helper, fall back to the context and look up on the context to see uh, if there's any value there. Otherwise, it's gonna basically resolve to undefined and not print anything to the screen. Um, inside, the, so this is a, a pretty big change, but I wrote like a seven step uh, rollout plan for this and we're still kind of at stage one or stage two. Um, so you can check it out. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, actually pretty painless because of the steps in there like adding lint rules and everything like that. Um, to projects by default, and so that before we even deprecate it, you'll get warnings and everything like that, say please like prefix this with either the at symbol or this dot. So that's just the templating layer, and so now we have to actually talk about, or that's talking about like things that aren't necessarily components, but they are more generic, I guess, in the templating layer. And I have to speed up because I have a lot of slides still. Um, so next we'll let's talk about components. Uh, the big, Thing that I think a lot of people saw in like Tom's keynote is this notion of like having this angle bracket invocation syntax. And so what RC311 was to allow for Ember components today to even use that angle bracket invocation. Um, and you don't need to be on like Glimmer components or anything like that. And one of the things that that, that RC is also trying to do is disambiguate this guy further. So you can have a helper that is foo dash bar and that would resolve as well. So what is it, and if you don't believe me, I've actually seen something uh, like this before. You would think that like x.post, surely it is a component. However, you can totally do this, and this will just work, where you create a div, and then you enter HTML, the post body into it, and return the node, and the node will just get in line like properly, and that will work. Um, so 
this is what we want to solve is like there's ambu ambiguity here in the syntax. Uh, so let's do something about it. So angle bracket syntax would change. If we had that as a component, it would change to this. Um, so we have X post and then we have all of the, like that. The at sigil is how you denote arguments going into it and then you use it on the inside like we've already seen before. Um, so let's dissect this a little bit more. So what does it actually mean to have an angle bracket invocation? Um, what it means is that it is invoked kind of like an HTML element, but there's another thing that you have to make sure happens, which is the first character of the invocation must be capitalized. Um, and that's how we disambiguate uh, like HTML elements uh, from uh, this component syntax. And because those are the rules, the dash rule no longer exists, so you can actually have single word components with the angle bracket invocation, which I think cleans up things uh, nicely, especially if you have like x dash, whatever, just to meet the component, uh, um, uh, in invoking, uh, the component invocation that exists today. The other thing you'll notice is that you pass things with like curlies instead of just a raw path expression. Um, the other thing that we have to talk about with angle bracket invocation is that it also introduced this notion of splat attributes. Uh, people uh, had mentioned it a couple times, but I'm gonna go over it again. So let's say you have post here, uh, it, it's encapsulating a template, but say, hey, I want to have another class on it called bar, uh, you could do this and notice that you don't prefix it with the at symbol, it is talking about an HTML attribute at this point, so that's the, the difference between those. Now, you automatically don't get the reflection in it. It, it requires the author to actually put the splat attributes on an element somewhere inside of the actual uh, template. But the nice thing about this is that uh, it's declarative uh, and what you actually get in the DOM is that the property or the actual attributes will merge together. Uh, so they don't clob or anything like that. It's just like adding more classes or attributes directly onto the elements. And luckily that has also shipped in 3.4. Uh, if you are not on 3.4, there's a polyfill that goes all the way back to 2.12 that allows you to use the syntax in your applications today. So I think that, that polyfill that Robert wrote is like awesome. Um, and so it allows you to get the, this new syntax much earlier. Um, another thing, another RFC, which is not really, it's not too related to the actual templating layer, but it has some repercussions of it, is RFC 311, which introduced this idea of custom components. So this RFC is talking about exposing the low-level primitives that allow us to make, uh, like, components have the semantics that they have and all the hooks that they have uh, inside of the Glimmer VM. So we expose this as public API, but one, one part of that RFC talks about what are the semantics of the HTML, uh, or of the template. And what it does is that it makes the templates WYSIWYG. So whatever you see in the template file is what you're gonna get in the DOM. And so uh, this example was also given where you, today you have like inner HTML semantics of, of your template. So you would write this inside your template, you go look in the DOM and you're like, hey cool, I got this cool ID and this cool class name that just automatically wrapped for me. That's because we have these wonderful APIs today, attribute bindings, class name bindings, tag name, element ID. Um, but that's all going away. Uh, so what this means is when you look at your template, uh, that's what you're actually gonna see in DOM, so you can just put a wrapping element with your own class name, all that other stuff is gone. Um, and that too is also in 3.4. 3.4 is a pretty big release. Um, it's bringing a lot of this stuff uh, so you guys can play around with it. Uh, if you wanna see an actual implementation of something that's using the component manager uh, API um, and use it or, and has like these types of semantics with the angle bracket invocation, you check out Robert's uh, Sparkles component. It's a, like a nice play on words for Glimmer. So, um, so that's all stuff that has landed. Uh, it's not really the future, but I mean, it's probably a future for a lot of your guys' applications. Um, it's the near future. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit of thing about things that are uh, further out on the horizon. Um, and so this is my warning, this is like terms of service. What you're about to see is like my opinion. Uh, it may uh, exist, it may not exist, it may completely change, but I thought I would share uh, some of these ideas. So 
let's just jump in. So RFC 353 is uh, an RFC that I wrote called Element Modifiers. Um, for those who aren't familiar with what element modifiers are, um, we have one in Ember, um, and it's action. Action can go in the what we call the element space of an HTML element. And what this does is it allows you to annotate HTML elements and give them kind of like superpowers. But the real thing that it's doing is that it's giving you kind of fine-grained control over DOM access. And so we kind of have that today, right? We have this dot element. And so you would wrap, you know, your, if you're trying to like add jQuery to an input field or something like that, you'll create a component. In the did insert element hook, you'll say this dot element, and you'll like attach whatever you want onto it. But uh, we kind of made templates WYSIWYG, so what you see is what you get. So there's no longer a guarantee of that outer HTML element being there. So this makes the templates effectively like fragments. And so what are the problems, or potential problems with this is like, let's say you have a template like this. Uh, this dot element type of API could totally work because you have a div at the top level. But let's say you come by and you're like, hey, I wanna have like this top level conditional here. What is this dot element? And how do you know when the blo block has like collapsed? Um, so for, for instance, if you, this problem exists today in Ember. Let's say you have this dot element and then you traverse deep into the DOM hierarchy of this dot element and you like set up an add event listener and that element happens to be inside of an, a conditional that collapses and you're never notified that it collapsed. You've effectively leaked the event listener on it because you have no way of like calling remove uh, event, uh, 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 remove uh, listener from the actual element. And so this idea of having element modifiers is being able to declare uh, onto specific elements to give them superpowers. So all the use cases that we have today where like, let's create a component to put the date picker on things, you can move it to this because typically all you have to do is just have this dot access to the element and then install your thing um, with very small hooks on it. Now. That's one RC. I also wrote this RC uh, 373, which is Element Modifier Manager, which is a lot of words. Um, but it's very similar to the custom uh, component RFC in that we're exposing the, the raw primitives to allow for element modifiers to be created in user space and define their semantics. And the reason why we uh, want to do this is that it's low level, we don't wanna put something in the framework like a completely like new base class type without really understanding how it's going to play out in the real wor world. Um, so this allows us to kind of create add-ons that implement the element modifier uh, backing classes and everything like that and you can use them in your application so it's kind of like the sparkles component example. Um, and we can play around with the, the actual public API before it goes into Ember and it's just an add-on. So like, let's say I put together an add-on that's using these kind of low-level primitives and I ex explore a base class and you can extend it and do whatever you want with it. Um, we'll probably check out what the public API looks like for that, try things out, maybe make some breaking changes. This is like highly experimental uh, type of stuff. Um, but then once we arrive at something that is good um, and we've seen real, use, uh, real usage out of it, then we'll probably actually ship the other RFC that outlines the, the backing class that potentially goes inside of Ember. Um, and that one is in final common period, so that one is probably going to happen. Uh, that's the only one in here that I can say with a decent amount of confidence that it's something like that is going to land. Um, the other one is name blocks, which is RFC 226. Everybody who is aware of this RFC is like super excited. What it allows you to do is um, I'm using the, just the example um, here, like this RFC came before the angle bracket invocation. What it effectively allows you to do is declare blocks of a uh, template that the actual uh, component are gonna be used on the backside. So there's other APIs in the JavaScript space that they call them like slots or, um, I'm trying to remember what other people call them, but it's just kind of like syntactic sugar for effectively something like this where you would have these templates in different uh, like 
files, and then uh, you could use that on the inside as like an argument with like at, at, or at header, and then it would render that block in place. Um, the issue with this, however, is that we introduce some ambiguity uh, into the, the actual templating language. And so what do I mean by that? So in the example that I showed, we had this thing, this uh, kind of HTML argument kind of hybrid thing to do the, the definition of the block. So you're like defining it. But it actually looks like you're kind of using it, right? We, we actually want to reserve a syntax like this to have a dynamic like tag name uh, thing and this would kind of foreclose on that entire design. Um, so there's this another RFC which is 317 which is named block syntax. Uh, this is still up for debate but it effectively does this. Uh, I think this was shown at Ebercoff and we got like a lot of like feedback on it. Um, so that is still kind of out there trying to figure out what we're gonna do about it, but um, I think we'll, we'll, we're gonna arrive at something soon. There's also this other limitation that we noticed um, after getting started on the actual implementation, we're like, ah, it would really be great if we could do a couple other things. So explicitly, the RFC says that you cannot have multiple named blocks for the same component. So in this example I showed, like let's say you have like a table component and then you have a body named block and then you have row named blocks and you wanna be able to just kind of write it like HTML. Well, that RFC specifically said that this is not allowed um, and that's kind of unfortunate because we want to have like this very kind of like expressive API that kind of mimics uh, HTML. Um, but like I said, uh, soon, trademark TM, uh, I think we're gonna actually arrive at something. I'm not promising anything, but it would be great if it was done by Emmerconf, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> and finally, uh, I think this is the last one, is RFC 367, which is actually called Module Unification for Ember Add-ons. I would like to rename it the Use Helper. Um, and so what that is is, uh, Add-ons, so today the way that add-ons work is you have an app directory and an add-on directory. At build time, or at runtime, effectively, your add-on namespace gets merged with your app's namespace. And so in a template, you don't really say where these components or helpers are coming from. And so that's kind of problematic with the goals around module unification, which is like, let's get to, let's use like things like ES6 imports, let's have much more static resolution rules, and so we need some way of bringing uh, add-on, or add-ons that are talking about the template layer into the, the actual template context. And so this proposes uh, a use uh, syntax where uh, the path there is only reserved for add-ons. You can't do like dot dot slash and like start importing things from your app um, in it. Uh, this is still under debate as well. Uh, I would highly recommend you guys look at the RFC, comment on it. Um, I think we will land at something that is like an import syntax for the, the template layer. I just don't know exactly what it's going to be. But it's a nice thing about this too is that we can then do like tree shaking of like the things that are t in the template layer because we have static syntax that's saying I'm using these symbols from this package. Uh, then we can write some tooling on top of it to like figure out that and drop the dead code from those libraries. And that was like some of the stuff that like Simon was like talking about is being able to do some of that stuff. So that's a lot of stuff. Uh, so I just want to quickly recap what it looks like to write uh, Ember templates in the future. Um, so the first thing, you get outer HTML semantics. Next thing you, you get is the required this dot. Oh, and, or, and you get arguments uh, that are passed to you, so you have like separate these two, two concepts. Uh, you get angle bracket invocation. Someday we'll have some version of name blocks. And then we'll have uh, element modifiers uh, probably pretty soon. Um, so this is kind of, this is like quite a few changes, and this is. One of the, so I guess this is the future, colon, you know, all of the terms of service and everything like that. Um, 
but I really like the direction that we're headed with the templating language. I think it's cleaning up a lot of things that are there and bringing a lot more clarity to it. So you know, in like really big projects, it can get very, very hairy and to like refactor things or whatever. Um, and I think this is going to make the templating inside of Ember even nicer than what it already is. So thank you. <laughs>